The show on the road here. Any, everybody get a, a ticket to fill out for a door prize? Okay, good. Okay. And uh, first I'll do a little introduction. Back here is my camera person, Danae. She's running the slides and my wife back there, Phyllis. And she and I just recently celebrated our 46th wedding anniversary. And I gotta, I gotta tell you a story related to that. <clears throat> when we first met back in 1969, she had four children from her first marriage. And my parents were dead set against the relationship. They said, it's never gonna work. She said, you guys will make it a year, or maybe a little bit longer, but I, I foresee you're gonna end up in a divorce court. And at first we listened to them a little bit, so we held off getting married. And then finally I told her, I says, you know, can you, do you and I really think we can make it? And she said, certainly. I said, she said, I don't see any reason why not. And so we got married and 46 years later, we're still together. <laughs> so it, it just goes to show you if you put your mind to it, you can make things work. And uh, I started collecting and digging in the pottery dump 50 years ago this month. And Red Wing closed in 1967. And in 68 and 69, the city used that dump area exclusively for a city landfill, garbage, whatnot and any demo stuff from any buildings getting destroyed in town, that all ended up down there. So I had to really wait until 1970 to really start hitting it. Well, even in 1970, that was still seven years before the society was formed. So I had a seven year head start on everybody for rounding up inventory. And I did, I had, you see in some of the videos, I had hundreds and hundreds of jugs and crocks and bowls and I had no clue what I was going to do with this stuff, you know. So, but I still kept saving it and then along in uh, 77 when the society was formed, I went to the first meeting at the museum and we briefly met, we put some things out in the yard, we talked for a bit, visited, he said, okay, we'll have another one next year in 78, and we all went home. It was a matter of hours. And then I went back in 78, and then I thought to myself, well, this could, this could be very interesting. I think this group is going to survive. And here, look, at, we're all still here 40-some years later. So it, it, was, it was a good deal. It worked out. <clears throat> and to explain some of my digging, I started in a, saw, in a zinc glazer originally, and I went down one particular day and I found 40 small buttercocks. And I finally found one that had advertising from Colorado, or Nebraska, excuse me. <clears throat> and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And then I quit, I took 20 of them home and I left 20 of the other crocs. Because <clears throat> next time I came back, they were gone. <laughs> <coughs> but, uh, and there was a bottle show that was in the Twin Cities, and I first started collecting bottles, so I thought, well, I'll go do the bottle show and I'll take that crock along and see if anybody's interested. Well, I, I sold it for a whopping $35, and I thought, man, this is great, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make a bunch of money here. And, and then I sell in the little crocks for two bucks a piece. So I was, I was doing great. And if there was, happened to be bottom sign crock, I was getting five. So I, I thought I was in, in money heaven all of a sudden. So that kept me going. But then also I liked the advertising. That was, advertising was my favorite. And so I started to collect advertising jugs. Not so, not so much crocks, but the jugs. And at one time I had over a hundred advertising jugs in my personal collection. And as the years went by, I just gradually phased them out to the point where I've got about, about a dozen left. And my specialty was 
local, Cannon Falls, Red Wing, Goodhue County primarily. And uh, that's how it started. But I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit about what went wrong in the kiln. And I'll start right here. This is a, a one gallon crock and you can see the bake separation in the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that one would have definitely leaked. And then this happened as well. And I'll show you how that worked. Every place, if you see a crock, if you tick it over, you see these white areas. Wherever that is, is where one of these was attached. And what these were was used for spacers in the kiln to keep pieces from bumping together. So every time you see one of them, that's, it represents the spot where one of these had been attached. And then once in a while, when they'd knock, and then they would just take and knock those loose, and they were supposed to come loose without damaging the crock. But in this case, it pulled a chunk off the crock, and it was useless. And then, of course, you had warpage. Pieces would get warped. And then the, the utilized kiln space, they would stick pieces inside other pieces. Here they stuck this one inside a crock like that, and then they fused together, plus it warped. And it was neat about this, it's got a nice little mark on the bottom, it says Red Wing Company, which is a very unusual mark. Found very, very few pieces marked that way. <clears throat> and another thing that would happen is they'd get overbaked, and they really saw, saw a super lot of heat. And what, in this case, this little bowl actually saw so much heat it it actually turned it kind of a green color. It should have been a, it should have been all brown, with possibly a salt glaze rim, but it got totally baked. And then they would have a problem with in stacking that things would stick together. <laughs> so you can see these churns covers. They just fused together, so they knew they wouldn't be able to get them apart without breaking them. So they pitched the whole works. And then things would drip, as it did in this case. All the stuff flying around would build up on the ceiling of the kiln, and then it would eventually drip. That's how you got your turkey drops. And this piece it dropped a big chunk of, of uh, stuff on there as well. Same story with this one dropped a big chunk on. Now people like that. You know, they think that's cool. And where's that one with all the little lids fused together? Right at the end. Yeah. There's one where the little stack of lids got fused together. Here. Pass that around so they can see how that did that. And then they had, what else was I going to show you? Don't break it. Don't break it. Yeah. yeah, don't break any broken pieces. This one, little half gallon, what happened to that is a little big separation on the bottom. So they never had a repair facility or anything, so they would never patch anything. They just would throw it. And I'll show you some of the neat markings. Sometimes the pieces would break pretty nicely, so we'd get a nice shard out of the deal. Yeah. And hold up yours and show them, Danae. Danae's got one over there. And then here's a six with a nice blue leaf, a or a three. Yeah. Neat powder. The number. The number? The number on the chart. 
Which one? Denise. Oh, okay. First, I'm going to tell them about this. You can see right up here, it's stamped RWSCO right near the top. Okay. This is a North Star find. When they, store, when they tore the North Star building down, we got to go in there and dig when the guys would get done working for the day. And I ran across the shard. It was 3594. Well, it turns out that 3594, they had a huge snowstorm in Red Wing. So they wrote on there to sort of remember that date. And that's how that <coughs> happened. And then, of course, this was a typical North Star design. Did you find that in the North Star plant? In the North Star dump, yeah. But wasn't that closed prior to 94? Closed in 96. Oh. It's opened in 92. You mean when they tore down the building? Yeah. That was... When they tore down the building for the motel, right. that's when they exposed the dump. Oh, cool. And we were able to get in there, unknown to us, because we're normally used to people telling us no way you can't go in there, liability concerns. They, the guy that was like the manager or the owner, he, he would have been happy to let us go in there. But we didn't even ask because we, we were so used to getting turned down <laughs> that we didn't even bother to ask and here he would have went for it. But as it is, we got in there and got a, a, a lot of stuff anyhow. Uh, the Holiday Inn Express and whatever is next door. Is that Nichols? Nichols. 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 Or American Inn, whichever which one of it. I think it's American Inn. When they dug for that, that's when they hit the North Star up. And it was huge. I mean, it was, they'd filled in a, a depression and they'd filled it up solid. So it was, well, it was probably uh, at least six years worth, or four years worth of stuff from the, the pottery. So the, it amazing me how much stuff they made in that time. It, it truly amazed me because they were in business for such a short time. Okay, I'll run through a few of these pictures and then we'll uh, do a couple door prizes. This was one of my favorite pieces. Uh, I don't own it anymore. A guy pestered me so much that I sold it to him. <laughs> it's, it's a four gallon with a nice, and they came down and made a turn went right into the leaf. Wow. So it was kind of an artist's own signature. And this is a tiny little bank. It was made for the Chicago's World's Fair in 1893 or 97, I don't remember which. But it's round and it's bisque. And when I first found that, I hit the back part and I thought, oh man, I, it was like a skull. It, it reminded me of a skull or I thought, my God, I hope I haven't hit a body in here. <laughs> but it turned out it was this. And uh, it was in about three pieces, but I got all the pieces and I glued it together and it's still one of my favorite pieces, even though it's damaged, but I still, I kept that one. Is that a one of a kind, Steve? Um, Not it, it was for a while. And then oh, the Dennis Nygaard, another digger, he went down and... <laughs> He, he got about seven of them. So there was a total of about 10 or 15 of them known. And we never knew the final, final color because these are all bisque. And somebody told me that it, it turned out the final color was uh, Albany glaze. And then they took and wiped the letters so the letters would show. I believe they gave them away as a souvenir, so that you would have thought there'd have been a lot more, because I'm sure a lot of people went to they the fair. Were, um, sold bisque. They were, they were brought to the fair. I think the kids were, could color it at the fair. Oh. Two showed up that were just kind of colored in, and uh, and there were hammer banks. You put your money in, no way right, to get it out right. except to yeah. smash it. <laughs> yeah, that was. So many yeah. yeah, there was no way to get the money out, unless you were handy with a butter knife and you could get them back <laughs> out to slot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
and this was the early days, it's probably from the 70s, where there was heaps of pottery and a lot of brush and stuff in there. But this is all shards laying around in the dump. Steve, were they laid on top of the earth like that, or is that like farmer's fields and rocks where stuff keeps coming to the surface? It was just basically laying around. Just laying. And this was a wintertime dig. And this guy is named Steve Savage. And he, he passed away a few years ago. But I gotta tell you a story and it involved this very hole. Uh, and you can see we were finding water cooler shards and in his pouch here he's got about three water cooler lids plus he got one under his arm. And under this tree here, he had tunneled and made a big hole. And Dennis and I both told him that it was unsafe. But he went in there anyhow and the whole thing collapsed. But when it came down, it came down like this. And he was under here. And it took us, what, 45 minutes or an hour? We had to bust him out of there. And I gave him hell afterwards. I said, do you realize that if you would have died in that hole, I'd never be able to dig here again? <laughs> <laughs> said he never thought of that. This was a wintertime dig. And this actually, Dennis had been down in this hole. And this was Chris Osterholst, and I don't know this guy, and then me. And we were lugging buckets. He'd fill buckets, we'd pull them out and dump them. But where were you down in there? About five, six feet. And this is a, this was about a seven foot deep, deep hole, and this is all the shards we were picking out of there. Occasionally we'd hit the whole solid kiln brick walls because they'd re replaced the bricks after about every five or six firings because the bricks were basically shot. And uh, so you'd hit a lot of bricks and that was heavy <coughs> bull work getting them out of there. There I am in my younger years. I've just been in this hole here and I'd, I'd make a big hole like this in the morning and I'd take a break and then I'd go make a big hole in the afternoon. I can't do that anymore. Is that the river in the background? That's that little pond, oh. that fishing pond. Oh. And back behind that's a little service road and then back there's Mississippi. Is there, there isn't anything in the pond, is there? Hmm? Is there anything in that pond? No. no. When they drained that, we didn't find a single thing down in there. That's actually what they were filling in, I think, was that pond. Okay. There's another shot of a deep hole. <coughs> yeah, I was digging in the summertime, and later on there'll be some shards that we found that day, but it was probably about 90 degrees, and I had to peel my shirt off, and I was going for it anyhow, and pretty soon in the afternoon I started getting to the point where I said, you know, I better get out of here or I'm going to have a heat stroke. Yeah. So I had to pull out of there early that day, but boy, I was, I was finding a lot of stuff. That's why I hated to quit. <laughs> and there's and then there's the pond back here, and then over there is the road. And this was a wintertime dig, and uh, it's about, <coughs> I think it was like 20 to 30 below that day. But it was a scheduled dig, I had the group from Wisconsin coming. So we said, okay, the dig will go on anyhow. And we all met at Godfather's Pizza. We went down there, we took a break at noon. And the one lady that was with us, at noon she said, you're not going back down there. I said, oh yeah, absolutely. She said, no, I'm not going. She says, you're going without me. She said, I'm not going back out in that cold. And, uh, <clears throat> The interesting thing about it is, is uh, she was video cam videotaping it and the camera got so cold it quit working. <laughs> but this particular day we were, we were pretty close to the tracks and the railroad f frowns on that, they don't like that. So if, if this was a few years later, I, we'd been digging in there, a guy by the name of, of Steve Mulick and I, and we come up and the train was crossed, so we couldn't cross back up to go to the car. So I said, well, let's bunch a whole little hole right here by the railroad tracks. So we went down and we started hitting advertising jugs from Chicago. And uh, man, we can't quit now. So we finished that day, then I came back the next day. 
and then another guy came with me. Well, the train came by, and the guy leaned his head way out the window, and just the way he looked at me, I knew something was going on. So I told the guy with me, I said, we're gonna have company in about 10 minutes, I know it. It was five minutes later, a little white truck pulled up, and it was a guy from the railroad. And he blasted me from one end to the other. He said, you cannot dig that close to the tracks. Do you realize what kind of a problem or what kind of serious trouble you'd be in if a train were to derail because of that? I said, well, I never thought of that because we were finding advertising jugs. <laughs> <laughs> so then he said, okay, I'm going to come back in 45 minutes. And he said, that hole better be filled in. Mm -hmm. So he came back in 45 minutes and we had it filled in. But to this day, <coughs> the vein went down and went directly under the tracks. Mm -hmm. So the tracks themselves set on dump. Oh. And uh, it's just one of those things, if they ever move the tracks, I'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> Is that track still active today? Oh, yeah. 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 And then some of the snakes will talk about them. This is a bull snake. He's about four feet long, and this is my daughter. She was never afraid of anything. And there she is with a little grass snake. But uh, snakes were real common in the fall, because they would come in there and hibernate <coughs> for the winter. And then in the spring, they'd come out of hibernation. So in, in uh, April and parts of May, there would be just literally hundreds and hundreds of snakes down there because they come out of the ground and then they'd go wherever they go for the summer then in the fall they'd come back. And uh, one day I was digging in there, <clears throat> I hit a three gallon crock was turned sideways and it must have had six or eight huge six foot ball snakes in it. Yeah. And I pull them out, of course in the winter time they're, they're like they're drugged up, you know, they're real slow moving and uh, so I'd, I'd take and throw them out of the, the hole into another hole and then they'd eventually slither down and get out of sight. But it never ended. I kept finding more and more snakes. So I said, that's it. I'm not going to dig this hole today. I'll wait for some other time. So I actually, I abandoned the snow. This, this, the hole, the snakes drove me out as well. <laughs> I was just tired of finding when I'm dealing with them. And that hot day I was telling about, this is the stuff I found that day. A, even a crock with a cover. And this was a 30 gallon cover. And these are all, uh, these planer jugs, you know, they're, you can buy them nowadays for like five bucks a piece because there's nothing on them. It was plain, but it was just loaded with them. And uh, these burnt up covers, and then these little butter crocks were all over the place too. Did they all have some problem though? They all did. Yeah, because they wouldn't have been thrown out if they didn't. No. Yeah. Not normally. They, uh, they'd be warped or a bake separation or discolored. <coughs> this particular day, this is a friend of ours from Arkansas. He was up, he was working at the power plant doing what they call a turnaround outage. And he wanted to go digging. So I took him down there and we found a 25 gallon crock and it had the bunghole. And we cleaned it up and it was absolutely perfect, little warped on the top, but it was in perfect condition. And he still has it today. And this is a shard I found in the dump and it's stamped with an H near the top. And this is the same I believe it was the same artist that drew the, the number. What does the H mean? I don't know. We've never been able to figure that out. And so this is the crock I found, and this is the, the shard I found. What the H stands for, nobody's been able to tell me. This is my basement. I had uh, about... <clears throat> About 75% of this stuff is stuff I found. You see this jug had a little knock in it. I found one five gallon beehive with the handle and a little mark on the bottom. And I had covers galore. 
and I had some advertising jugs. And I found three water coolers and an ice water cooler and some of these uh, chicken feeders. And uh, later on, I even found a uh, self-draining jar. No, no, that, that's, that's one I picked up someplace, probably bottle digging. This is one of the buttermilk feeders. There was a buttercrock from Chicago I found. I still, I kept that one. This one is interesting. It's a little five-inch flower pot saucer. It's got backward ends oh. in the mold. It could have been why they threw it. And this is a butterfly shard with RWSCO, just the initials. Sometimes they break real nice, so we had the whole shard. And there I am holding this jug. This was the biggest one I ever found. And then this is a handle oh, that went with it. What size would that have been? Oh, probably a 15 or so. And it was made for a store advertising piece to set in their front window. I'm going to eventually just donate this to the museum because I think that's where it belongs. And this one I found <clears throat> when they drained the water down to make the pond bigger or to make it deeper, they drain it completely dry. So we were able to get down, what do you figure, four, six feet deeper to us. And that was found over in the one spot that's normally underwater. And it's a big spittoon and it's on display in the museum. If you look at the liquor display, it's right down on the floor. <clears throat> and this, we hit a whole pile of these that were dumped out, these salt glaze from Dubuque, Iowa. And this one I found had the top sheared off right about in there and handled everything. So I took and got another handle off of another, another, cro uh, another jug. And I shaped it and formed it and I worked on it. I got it so it fit in there just perfect. And then I built that all up and it really looked nice and I sold it to a guy from Iowa for $700. He, he wanted it. <coughs> And this was a, a blue sponge bowl, and I believe it was a special order because it had a matching cover. Mm -hmm. It was also made out of sponge. Mm -hmm. Morse. Morse. Right here, back row. Mm -hmm. And this is a flower pot, of course, mm -hmm. and these came from what we call Pottery Road. Pottery Road. It's on the backside. It's over. Actually, goes out into the Mississippi, okay. and we found all of these shards. Here's a, here's one in white. We found all these shards, so we were able to definitely prove that that was a red ring piece. And here's some of the other stuff we found. And here's a, a bowl with a kind of an unusual mark on the top. And here's those five sided ones that we were able to determine were red wing. And even right down to a dog food dish was Red Wing. And we didn't know that before because this was all newer stuff. And yeah, I go down there when I can, but a few years ago I had a heart attack and the doctor told me, he said, you know, he, yeah, he'd say, slow down a bit. And, and it, through your digging, you were able to discover pieces that you people <coughs> were unaware that it was <coughs> right because you found a piece. Yep, exactly. Yep, and I got to tell you, this one was a little quart jug with a four-inch wing on it, and I never found the rest of the shards. I just got the little tail on it, but I looked. I looked all over for the rest of it because I really wanted that. And here is an example, it's a five gallon jug from Chicago, but it had right on there, to be returned when empty. Oh. 
<laughs> so you weren't supposed to keep it. And these were stacking rings. They would go like that. Then this would sit on a crock and the jug would sit like that. And that's what these were for. And these were kiln spiders. If you look on any piece of art pottery or dinnerware or anything, you're gonna see three little marks on the bottom and that's where this was set so that it held that piece off of the, touching the one below it. And this is an interesting spittoon because if you look real close, it's stamped RWSCO. So I can't tell you how many spittoons I've looked at hoping to find that mark, but so far nothing. And of course we find occasionally so many jugs. I found uh, one year we found a whole bunch of them that said Red Rig Union Stoneware, little white ones. And they all, of course they all had the handles broke off because they broke so easily. But when those turned up, one guy found them and the next couple days we had 25, 30 people down there <laughs> <laughs> scratching away looking for more. And this, we figure, I've heard several stories now. They said that these were like water cooler stands where you would stick your, your spigot would be here and then you stick your cup around and went there and then hit the spigot and supposedly got what you wanted. And this one was marked five for like a five gallon. And here's a case where bowls stuck together because they'd stack one on top of the other. And uh, I could probably get them apart if I were to knock their edges with a screwdriver or something, but I just left them there just because they're great for seminar pieces. Okay, didn't move them too. This was a, a day we took, this, this guy and I took all these cover shards, laid them on a trailer to see if we could put any of them together. <laughs> Out of that whole bunch, we got two covers <laughs> that fit together. And there's like I was telling you, that's what I used to have. Uh, we'd, we'd find 10, 15, 20 jugs in a weekend with no problem. And these were just basically common jugs. Normally you had a little something wrong with it. Sometimes though, they had nothing wrong with them. I think they just had a needed space. And they thought, well, we'll just throw something sort of common out to make room for this other stuff. As her uncle worked for the Red Wing Potteries, and he told us that one day they told him to go down to the castle room. and threw all the castles out of there because he wanted that room for something else. So they loaded them all up and hauled them to the dump. Have those been cleaned up? They weren't that clean when you found them, were they? No. No. They just scrubbed them up. Washed them up, yeah. yeah. There's a, now I got a lamp here. Oh, I, I sold my lamp. But that's what I make. I make lamps. And this one I made for myself, but I had a big logo from a Red Wing jug. And that's what I put in my lamp. And then this one was from North Dakota. And this was from Chicago, and I had them from all over. And I thought that was a good way to, to use them shards. This year at the sale, he's got magnets. Yeah, if anybody's interested. They're magnets for the refrigerators. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're, they're little magnets. And, they, and I had to go to Ace Hardware to find a strong enough magnet to hold them to, so they wouldn't fall off. But I thought, oh, that'd be a cool way to use some of the shards. So you and this one, pardon? Oh, okay. Yeah, this was a jug from Sydney, Nebraska, and Denison, I were down there that day, 
and they were all, remember, they were all clumped together and all had damage. It was like a collapse took place in the kiln and tumbled all of these jugs together. Mm -hmm. So they pitched them all out. Mary Plant? <laughs> there I'm in about, in the early 70s, I did a display. And uh, this was the stuff I had accumulated in about three, four years. That was worthy of this. Oh, this one? Is that yours? No, no. <laughs> that was a display next to me. There's a fruit jar I found. That was inside of a crock. And when I dug the crock up, the fruit jar was actually loose. It had come loose after they thrown it in a dump. But it still showed where it had stuck to the crock. Pat Jurgen? And this was interesting because it's a butterfly shard. And this is John Rich Sewer Pipe Works, Red Wing, Minnesota. And there again, I, I couldn't find the rest of those shards. I looked and looked. But it was strange that it would be stamped John Rich. It's, I don't know how that, because he, he actually, he was the president of the Sewer Pipe Works at the same time he was president of the Stonework Company. So somehow his little side stamps got mixed up. That's probably why they dumped it. Exactly. And then this was his little cover I got right here. That's the same one. And this is what she does with flower pot or uh, sewer pipes. We we drag them home and uh, she turned them into planters. I have two acres of front yard, all flower beds. And they notice these here. I said, we need to get a few of them. We have two weeks to get them. We have 750 of them. <laughs> so all my flower beds are raised. <laughs> they were sewer pipes. These things were made by the sewer pipe company and they were filters. Oh, yeah. You put them in a tank and you put them halfway across. You dump in the stuff you wanted filtered on one side mm -hmm. and then would filter through to the other side and to get a all the heavy lumps and stuff about on it. About 25, 30 pounds a piece. And they, were, they were, weren't very good because the holes were too small. So they would plug up real quickly. Now you didn't find those sewer pipe things in the Red Wing dump, did you? No, they, they, were, in, they were in the sewer pipe dump. Yeah. This is the biggest one I ever found, a 60. And then of course just the little smaller shards. Yeah, yeah. There's dump along the creek bed, both sewer, both sewer pipe and Minnesota stoneware. And this is a shed, a two a two seater outhouse, a his and a hers, and uh, I, I I did a I did a uh, privy dig down in Reed's Landing, Minnesota, and the lady told us two things I want you to do, and I'm going to give you this privy is you got to get rid of that and you got to get rid of the lilacs. So I called her up, I said, do you want a, an old privy? And she said, sure. So it cost me a hundred bucks to run a trailer to get it home. Wow. <laughs> but it's home and then I did the roof and it was amazing in the, in the roof, when I ripped the old shingles off, I found a Coca-Cola tin sign oh. that, that they had used for a patch. This is a barn cupola with my own shard bed out back. <laughs> so I got this my own water, little... This water tank up there, uh, we found it in Alma, Wisconsin. It cost $50 to get it and $100 to get it home. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't free. And then the, the sewer pipes again. Welch. Welch. Mm -hmm. Here's a, another crock with a typical yeah. bake separation. And this was an interesting piece. It's a little half gallon jug. And somehow during the firing, it got exposed to the salt. It should have been all brown, but it got half, so it's half salt and half brown. And then this one, the same thing. They had covers stacked on top and then they slid over a bit. 
and exposed more of this to the salt glaze, so it got more salt glaze than it was supposed to. And then last fall, I took a, a bunch down with me, and in October we went digging, and I was the straw boss, and they, they were my workers. And they said, we don't have a clue where to go, where, where should we go? I said, well, I got a place marked down along the tracks. So we went down there and they, they dug down, and sure enough, we got into hazel jars. There's, there's what they're supposed to look like. And funnels. And there's what the funnel's supposed to look like. So we're getting in a whole batch of them. We're going to back, go back this fall and finish the job. And there's the one that Danae had over there, the shard. There's another of the sewer pipes. How big an area is the actual dump area? Does, does it cover acres or how big it is it? It used to cover about five acres. Five acres. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to about, what do you think's left, Dennis, one or two? Has it all been dug out except for the one or two? No. Well, no, the rest got covered over. Oh. They got the skateboard park, and they got boat storage. And when I first went down there when I was a kid, there would be stacks and stacks of dishes that were partially glazed or unglazed, or the glaze had run in on them, and they pitched them out. And they didn't bust them up, they pitched them out, they threw them out, and they'd be, they'd be stacks of dishes four or five feet high. Wow. And I'd take them, because I was a kid, I didn't know any of that. I'd <laughs> squirm <them> around like <laughs> frisbees. That was fun. I, I'd go with my mom, to, and she'd go to the pottery salesroom, and I said, I don't want to hang out in the pottery salesroom, so I'd go over the hill and go down to the dump. Yeah. I still got two pieces at home. One's a little small saucer or plate with pink stripes on it, so it was a test piece, and the other one's a tiny little vase with a test number on the bottom. So I, I saved two pieces out of hundreds that I did find. Includes the stuff you can still get at. I know you guys got that all marked and coded with letters and numbers. Yeah. How much can't you get at? Half you can't get at? A couple acres you can still get at. So about 40% is no. virgin territory. Right. I would say that uh, possibly 80 to 90% of the dump has not been dug because it's under. Is there more beyond that bridge? Is there more dump beyond that bridge? No. Going towards uh, the Burnside area? No. That rail, rail bridges? That's, that's where it kind of ends. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Here's a big feeder with a chunk knocked out. Here's the uh, self-draining jar I found. And here's some North Star covers. And these were after North Star closed in 96. Red Wing continued to use the North Star molds. And you would see these colors listed in the catalogs under ice water jars. So they, would, they were still using them and seemed like they were primarily putting, putting them on ice water crocs. And this is a one I found in Mankato. It's uh, it's a pickle jar from Burlington, Iowa, and Kansas City, but it's made by uh, Western Pottery, I believe. But it was r along the river, and it was all the pieces laid there. It was just smashed. You find that in a couple pieces, a couple pieces? Yeah, about four pieces. <coughs> here's, a, here's the ice water I found, and it's pretty nice shape. Here's a two-gallon crock that Kevin Williams is going to fix for me. But it, it's got such a nice blue mark and it's got such a nice bottom mark. Even though it's missing a small chunk on the side, it was one I dug out of the dump, so I'm going to get it repaired. And there's a four-gallon beehive I found that was brown because it was mixed in with a wire and rusty metal. And when, when uh, it comes in contact with rusty metal and wire, 
it seems like that rust is able to penetrate into the, the glaze. And it, it's something that I have never been able to figure out quite how to get out of there. And this is a, <coughs> this came from down by the Super 8 Motel. Uh, when they built the Super 8 Motel, they did some work in the parking lot and they exposed part of the Minnesota Stoneware dump. And I got the okay from the workers to go in there while they were doing it. And I dug some of these uh, bowls and some crocs and some other, and a few covers and stuff before they told me I had to, had to get out of there. And this was one which is right here. And it's got Hager on the bottom. So I did. I think they did a little work for Hager Potteries. What do they do? What, what do they use that style for, or what is that style called? This one here. French pot. Probably something like that. Something like that. But I think Hager got behind and they said, "Redring, will you help us out and make a few pots for us?" So they did it. I got any more, didn't I? Yeah. Here's a North Star cover. <laughs> we, did, we would occasionally find them mixed in with the red one. So some, somehow, and this was, this was North Star. It's a, with, it's a circle with no tail. Yeah. You know, I think it looks to me like it was done by the same guy. <laughs> And that's, go ahead and go to, you can go to the next one. This is some of the North Star pieces I found and the damage they suffered. This one had the whole bottom blown out of it. But it should have been, it should have been like that back there. And this was a five gallon that I found in a deer, deer hunt when I was a kid. And it laid in a log jam down along the river for five years. Every year I went back, I'd spot it still in there. <clears throat> and what saved it was it had a cork in it so it would never fill up with water. Mm -hmm. And finally, I dug it out of the, the log jam. I took it up to the farmer and I said, can I buy this or can I take it? Or do No, he says, you put it in the barn. He says, I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. So another five years went by and then I went out there one day and. His wife said, do you, I asked her about that jug, and she said, well, you wanted that pretty bad, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did. She said, well, you give me $35, and you can have it. So I finally got it, but it took 10 years. And this was a little salesman sample that Paul Bowden and I found, and you can see how blurry it was. So that's why they threw it out, because it wasn't good for, a, for the salesman to take that with him. It was just a tiny little piece like that. And it would be something the salesman would drag along with him and show a potential customer. And then they'd make the orders from that. And this is one I'm going to get, try to get Kevin Williams to repair for me. It's Glenwood, and it was Glenwood Springs, and it was actually from St. Paul. It's a nice little two-gallon beehive jug. Any questions? Okay, then we're going to, I got door prizes. <laughs> you run out of tickets? No, I have tickets. You want to get, find something? Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask, is this, was this found in no. yes. is it Red Wing? Yes. Yeah. Really? I didn't know they used that color clay. Yeah. Hmm. That was a, probably one of the newer ones. Hmm. Sandy Hyde. Hyde. Yeah. Okay, give, her a give her that little jug right there. If you'd like that, you can have that as a souvenir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, a few more. Well, we don't. No, not not right away. No. We got time. <laughs>